talking today on um, guidelines that are being developed by the physio department for the rehabilitation of patients post rotator cuff repair. Um, as we're aware, there are a variety of surgical techniques that can be used to repair the rotator cuff, and the aim was to produce a rehabilitation protocol based on the evidence available in the literature. Sorry, I'm trying to talk up. <laughs> Um, so the guidelines set out three main phases of rehabilitation. The initial phase where the primary goal is to protect the newly repaired rotator cuff. The secondary phase where the patient can commence a more active rehabilitation program. And then the final phase where they should be progressing towards full function um, and should incorporate a strengthening program. So the principles that it's based on is the gradual and timely application of stress to the repair through appropriate range strengthening and shoulder girdle stabilisation exercises. I'm just going to talk about the initial healing first. Um, I guess the first question is what is the optimal positioning for immobilisation? There have been um, some studies conducted by Riley and Hatakayama. So Riley looked at the tension across the repair, the rotator cuff repair intraoperatively and found that there was an increase of 34 newtons tension by another cadaveric study. The repair site, as did internal rotation in any position. Also, with regards to immobilisation, another question is what duration should patients be immobilised for? There have been several animal studies which have obvious limitations um, that looked at um, duration of immobilisation, and in rats, it was found that prolonged immobilisation resulted in improved um, tendon to bone healing in increased organisation of the collagen and improved mechanical properties. So, but, and in a follow-up study they found that um, rats that were immobilised for a short period of time, so about two weeks, followed by an exercise program actually had poorer outcomes than those that were immobilised for longer periods of time. So, one of the primary concerns with prolonged immobilisation is long-term stiffness. Um, in a study by Bradford, they looked at immobilisation for six weeks and they found that while some patients did have stiffness at the six weeks post-op mark, um, at the one year follow-up they didn't have long-term stiffness and they felt that it may have resulted in better healing. Uh, alternatively, there has been a, a small pilot study which looked at immobilisation of four weeks compared to six weeks. Um, and they found that both groups significantly improved in pain and range of motion and they felt that there wasn't any adverse effects from um, early mobilisation. So based on the evidence available, the guidelines are suggesting an immo immobilisation in, in an abductor, abductor sling um, at 30 degrees abduction and neutral rotation at all times except when performing exercises and when showering for six weeks post-op. Sorry, I'm not sure why that's like that. Um, during this phase, um, we'd also um, be starting some exercises to promote range of motion, and the goal would be that the exercises would be as passive as possible to protect the repair. So in an EMG study looking at um, act activation in the shoulder musculature during um, exercises, it's been found that Therapist-assisted passive range, CPM and Codman's pendulum, pendular exercises had the least muscle activity, followed by self-assisted bar raising exercises, and finally pulley exercises have the most active muscle activity of the active-assisted exercises. There have been some concern regarding um, patients performing pendulum exercises correctly. Um, ideally, the, the patient should be bending over and the 
the arm should be completely relaxed with the um, movement generated from trunk movement. A study looking at correctly versus incorrectly performed pendulum exercises found that large amplitude pendulum exercises and exercises performed incorrectly generated more supraspinatus muscle activity when compared to smaller diameter correctly performed pendulum exercises. At the moment, the use of CPM in rotator cuff, post rotator cuff repair is not supported in the literature. Another form of exercise that patients may be using would be hydrotherapy. So shoulder elevation in water at slower speeds has significantly lower um, activation of the rotator cuff when compared to land-based exercises. And in a small study uh, comparing two group groups, one of whom did um, land-based exercise program plus hydrotherapy to another group that just did land-based and a land-based exercise program alone, found that there was um, significantly greater passive range of motion of flexion at three and six weeks post-op when compared to land-based exercises alone. At 12 weeks, both groups had significantly improved in passive range and Western Ontario rotator cuff scores. We would also be encouraging patients to do supplementary exercises at this stage. So range of motion exercises at the elbow, wrist and neck um, and scapular stabilisation exercises. As it's been shown that there's decreased um, up, scapular upward rotation and increased anterior tipping and medial rotation in patients with impingement, which correlated with a reduction in middle and lower serratus anterior and altered upper and lower trapezius activity. So based on those studies, we'd be recommending that patients perform passive range of motion from greater than 30 degrees elevation in the coronal and scapular planes and from zero to 60 degrees external rotation. The exercises would include therapist assisted passive range, Codman's pendulum exercises, passive table slide exercises and hydrotherapy once the wounds are healed. Also be doing exercises to normalise scapular position um, and providing ex education on posture. So the goal that's been set in this phase would be to achieve passive range of elevation in the scapular and coronal planes to 120 degrees um, and external rotation to 45 degrees. We'd also be encouraging patients to use um, cryotherapy, um, advising them to use ice for 15 to 20 minutes, four to six times daily in the first 48 hours post-op and following exercise in the first 10 days, um, as it's been shown to significantly reduce post-operative pain, um, pain intensity, result in better sleep and less perceived need for analgesia. So um, moving on to the next stage of rehabilitation, unfortunately there's not a lot of evidence um, to support specific timeframes for progressing patients. Um, there has been one study in a baboon model um, which looked at bone tendon repair and they found that it was macroscopically healed at eight weeks, however the Sharpie fibres holding the bone and the tendon together didn't appear in any considerable number before 12 weeks. So they felt that this suggested that excessive tension on the repair site should be avoided for at least 12 weeks and possibly longer. So based on that evidence, the guidelines are recommending to discard the shoulder immobiliser at six weeks and start using the arm in light daily activities. From six to eight weeks, commence active assisted range of motion exercises like cane exercises, pulleys, being careful to avoid um, impingements and fingers up the wall. And then from eight weeks post-op, commence active range of motion as tolerated as the tendon should be macroscopically healed. And the goal is to progress the shoulder range to within normal limits for the patient. During this stage, if there were any ongoing re restrictions in range, the physio may use supplementary mobilisation techniques. It's been shown that at 30 degrees of abduction, anterior-posterior 
posterior, anterior and um, traction mobilisation techniques do not put increased strain across uh, rotator cuff repairs. That could be used at that stage. In terms of progressing to the final stage of rehabilitation, uh, we can look at that baboon study which says that at 12, prior to 12 weeks we shouldn't put excessive strain through the rotator cuff repair or else we can look at a criterion based progression to strengthening. So there was a study conducted by Rokito et al who looked at um, progress, patients who had large or massive chronic rotator cuff tears um, and their protocol was to commence strengthening once they had at least 80% of normal range of motion um, to commence isometric and isotonic strengthening at that stage and they found that they had significant improvements in pain, function, range of motion and strength in these patients. So there are some options, there are options for the guidelines. We can trial a criterion based progression to strengthening exercises using the Rokito study um, or we could specify a time frame prior to which strengthening exercises shouldn't be performed, so 12 weeks. Um, or we could use both. We could say at 12 weeks, prior to 12 weeks, no strengthening. After that, once the patient has 80% of range, to commence strengthening exercises. Like, I'd like to hear your opinions on that. Um, so once a patient does progress strengthening exercises, it would be a gradual progression, isometric exercises, to progress to TheraBand-resisted cuff exercises in non-elevated position. Um, progressing the hydrotherapy program to incorporate resistance exercises, for example with paddles, and cautiously progress to exercises in elevated positions. Also be encouraging capsular stretching as tightness in the posterior capsule has been shown to increase superior translation of the humeral head um, during flexion, which increases the likelihood of impingement. So they can commence cross-body stretches at this stage. More pictures. Uh, in terms of return to sport or to manual labour, there's no evidence available that I could find. Um, the guidelines uh, recommend a gradual uh, introduction of sport specific exercises and the return to sport or manual labour to be made in con um, conjunction with consult consultation with the surgeon. So the patient should be symptom free, have adequate range, strength and control and power necessary for their sport. So that's, that's the talk. Um, I think that there are a few on